Hello, and welcome to the podcast of the Gem State Substack. I'm your host, Brian Allman. If you're not already subscribed, I invite you to do so now at gemstate.substack.com. Free subscribers get multiple posts per week, while for the cost of a cup of coffee a week, you can support my work and get exclusive features and early access to articles, videos, and podcasts like this one. I really appreciate it. The conflict in Gaza this past month and the worldwide reaction to it has laid bare what I think is the central fault line in the world today, and that is between those who build civilization and those who would tear it down. Both the Muslim migrants in Europe and America who are marching on behalf of Hamas, and the leftists who promote them and make excuses for them in the name of so-called decolonization, are examples of those who would tear down civilization. They're the heirs to the French Jacobins who executed thousands in the name of the revolution and who desecrated Notre Dame with a goddess of reason, to the Spanish communists who tore down churches and raped nuns in the lead-up to the Spanish Civil War, and to Mao's Red Guards who turned in their own parents for the crime of having traditional Chinese values. What all these barbaric regimes have in common is a desire to erase the past. In every case, these revolutions sought to destroy any vestige of civilization and start anew. The French Revolution explicitly created a new calendar that began with year zero. If you were on Twitter last week, you saw images of the statue of Robert E. Lee being melted down by museum curators who are following in the footsteps of Robespierre and Mao. This statue had been at the center of controversy for several years, Leadership in its home city of Charlottesville announced that they'd be tearing it down, so a bunch of people showed up to protest. Antifa and other leftist groups attacked the protesters while police stood down rather than protecting them. A leftist woman was killed trying to block traffic, and the media successfully twisted it into a national story about evil, murderous, right-wing white supremacists, rather than what it really was. Ordinary people upset that American history was being erased, just as it was in revolutionary France and the Chinese Cultural Revolution. You see, the reconciliation between North and South after the Civil War is perhaps the most positive thing to come out of the ashes of that conflict, one that saw more Americans killed than any other war in our history. Today, that reconciliation is being erased in the name of a new civic religion based on grievances and victimhood, which is passionately promoted in many cases by people who have no historical connection to the Civil War themselves. They've torn down Confederate statues. They've renamed military bases that were named in honor of Confederate generals. They've even exhumed bodies, and, you know, the battle flag, once a symbol of Southern pride, has effectively been banned in our society now. This iconoclasm dishonors the dead on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. The American left is relitigating the Civil War not because it needs relitigating, but because they're signaling what they will do to you and to me. Melting down a bronze Robert E. Lee is a proxy for burning us, our families, our communities, our books, our traditions, throwing them on the ash heap of history. In addition to melting down the statue, those same barbarian iconoclasts desecrated the memorial to Robert E. Lee's horse traveler, as well as countless other Confederate memorials. They even dug up the bones of General Nathan Bedford Forrest. This isn't what civilized people do. Union soldiers who fought the bloody Civil War in the first place and saw their friends die at the hands of the Confederates had more respect for their adversaries than leftists today. In my post earlier this year for Memorial Day, I quoted a speech by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. He was wounded three times during his service to the Union Army, but would later go on to become one of our most prominent Supreme Court justices, and his writings on American jurisprudence are still routinely cited today. In 1884, nearly two decades after the end of the Civil War, Holmes gave an address to a post of the Grand Army of the Republic, a fraternal organization of Union veterans. In his speech, Holmes recognized that the men who fought for both the North and the South did so for what to them were good reasons. He said, quote, The soldiers who were doing their best to kill one another felt less of personal hostility, I am very certain, than some who were not imperiled by their mutual endeavors. We believed that it was most desirable that the North should win. We believed in the principle that the Union is indissoluble. We, 
or many of us at least, also believed that the conflict was inevitable, and that slavery had lasted long enough. But we equally believed that those who stood against us held just as sacred conviction that were the opposite of ours, and we respected them as every man with a heart must respect those who give it all for their belief. End quote. The victorious North allowed the defeated South to honor their own heroes, but today's Maoist leftists seek to erase any vestige of Southern culture. Robert E. Lee was once universally admired on both sides of the conflict, until just a few years ago when the forces of intersectionality and decolonization turned on him. He won't be the last, however. As much as the Republican Surrender Caucus might wish it, the left will not be satisfied if you give them this much. If you acquiesce to the destruction of Confederate monuments and renaming military bases, they won't stop there. But seeing weakness, they will grow bolder. President Donald Trump warned us, after the Charlottesville riot, that they would come for George Washington and Thomas Jefferson next. The media laughed at him and mocked him, but it's already begun. These same forces have torn down monuments to Teddy Roosevelt, and even Abraham Lincoln himself already. Every argument for tearing down Robert E. Lee, you know, he was a slave owner. He rebelled against the government. It can be applied to Washington, too. Remember that it was Lee's father, Light Horse Harry Lee, who gave the eulogy for Washington, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. Robert E. Lee married into Washington's adopted family, and he inherited Washington's own war sword. When he took up arms on behalf of his beloved Virginia, he believed he was following in Washington's footsteps, not betraying his example. They melted him down anyway, and they gloated about it. And what are they raising up in his place? Disgusting modern art that damages the soul rather than building it up? Statues of career criminals like George Floyd? This is not an attempt to present a balanced view of history, as they sometimes claim. Rather, it's rewriting history altogether. They want your children to grow up in a country whose heroes are men like George Floyd, and where the names of Washington, Lincoln, and Lee are forgotten as if they never existed. This is exactly what George Orwell warned about in 1984. Every link to the past has been broken. Carl Benjamin, the host of the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, explained how tearing down Lee's statue is a crime against civilization itself. I'm going to play a clip from his Sunday show because he says it better than I can. I mean, you are right to say it's literally against civilization because if civilization is the continuum and uh, accruing of um, cultural layers and inheritance from the past, then, I mean, that's what the Robert E. Lee statue actually really does represent in this particular case. Whether you agree with the two sides of the Civil War or not, and I'm not an American, so I really don't care. You know, I've got zero investment in the Confederacy or the Union. You know, I'm not an American. I don't care, right? It's not, you know, I wouldn't care if it, history had gone the other way. What difference would it make to me, right? But the, but the point is, this is what happened in America, and the statue becomes totemic and symbolic about that issue and what that meant to the development of the American Republic. And so it's something that you carry forward from the past into the future by means of the present. And that's literally what a civilization is like metaphysically. That's what the thing is. And so, th yeah, attacking that thing, you are, I think calling it anti-civilization is the best way of framing it. Let me ask you something. Why does Boise have an Anne Frank Holocaust Memorial? Idaho had nothing to do with the genocide of European Jews and other groups at the hands of Nazi Germany. Yet it was placed there so that people would remember what happened and make sure something like that never happens again. With that in mind, ask yourself why there's such a push to tear down memorials to great Americans and replace them with monuments to Marxist intersectionality. Talk show host and Twitter personality Jesse Kelly said something a few years ago that I've kept written down. He said, quote, as a country, you will eventually turn into what you look up to, period. If you idolize scum, you will become scum. If you idolize the greats, you will become great. End quote. What are the makers of modern culture attempting to turn us into? What are they idolizing by raising statues of George Floyd while tearing down Washington and Lee? American children used to grow up learning to walk in the footsteps of honorable men like George Washington or Robert E. Lee to practice virtue and honor. And now they're being raised to be perpetual victims, pawns of a revolutionary ideology of death and destruction. Those Harvard students who signed a letter supporting Hamas, they were raised in this environment, taught that their life's mission was decolonization, 
which, as we now recognize, means the wholesale murder and genocide of the descendants of Western civilization and the complete erasure of our culture and history. Our response needs to be to hold the line when it comes to our heritage and history. If you think you can compromise with these iconoclasts, let them destroy some Confederate statues that you agree are problematic, you've already lost. You're the naive appeaser who, according to Winston Churchill, feeds your neighbors to the crocodile in hopes that he will eat you last. No, we need to hold the line. Our past is worth remembering, warts and all. We honor men like Lee, not because they owned slaves, but because they were decent and honorable people. Here in Idaho, we're far removed from the Revolution and the Civil War and those tangible reminders of our nation's history. But we still remember our own history. When I worked in Boise, I would walk past the statue of Senator William Bora nearly every day, and it inspired me as a reminder of what he accomplished and how I'm standing on the shoulders of giants like him. In Andrus Park stands a statue of Abraham Lincoln, who as president signed the law proclaiming the creation of the Idaho Territory. Nearby stands Frank Stunenberg, the early governor of Idaho who was assassinated in a union dispute. How soon until the iconoclasts come for Lincoln, for Stunenberg, for Bora? You might say they don't have a reason to, but they don't need a reason, because barbaric iconoclasm doesn't operate in the realm of reason. It's a purely emotional need to tear down the past, to tear down the monuments of your enemies, no different than when the ancient Assyrians razed the cities they conquered. The response we need is not reasoned debate, compromise, but like a parent telling a toddler to stop coloring on the wall, we need a resolute no. Our ancestors weren't perfect, but they were pretty darn good as far as the annals of history are concerned. But even that doesn't matter. They're our ancestors. They're part of the fabric of our heritage and history, and they deserve to be remembered. Don't let the modern-day Red Guards erase them from history, because once they've erased our history, they'll come for our present and our future as well. My name is Brian Allman, and this has been the podcast of the Gem State Substack. Subscribe at gemstate.substack.com, and I'll see you next time.